Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Just uh, so a few words about myself. I, I've, um, I will have hit 39 years in the shipping industry in September. I know, you, I know to look at me, you would not believe that. Um, in that 39 years, I've spent roughly two-thirds of my time involved with oil tankers and probably a third of my time involved with, um, with the offshore side of things as well. I have actually sailed and supply vessels and semi-subs and various other things like that. So I, I have some um, ideas about the, uh, uh, about the crossovers between the two industries. Uh, and what I want to talk about is, is uh, how, the, how the tanker industry has handled some quite significant challenges over the last 30 or 40 years. Um, and indeed how, that, uh, how those challenges have, um, have brought us to where we are today, uh, and also some thoughts about where, where that could be going in the future. Um, and at some point I should probably remember to press the button to, to put the outline slide up that I've just sort of talked through. Um, the, the tanker industry had a sort of decade of shame in the 70s and 80s, so I'm going to talk a bit about that. Uh, I'm going to talk a bit about what happened um, to, to put, those, put that situation right. I'm also going to talk a bit about where the industry has got to today uh, and also predictably where the industry is going and, and there are a lot of issues, not entirely to do with HR, that I'll, I'll bring up um, in that um, discussion. There are some choices that people in the industry have got to consider at the moment, cost versus risk is one of them. Um, and the other one is to do with what I would call resilience and, and, and whether resilience is about people, whether it's about process or whether it's about something else. I'll also try and draw uh, draw together at the end some, some thoughts about how what has happened in the tanker industry could or could not be, a, be applicable to the, to the offshore industry. Um, if you look at this um, presentation, if you look at these pictures, uh, which went through the route rather quickly, there's about five or six of them. These were a very sort of um, regular show on television in the <coughs> 70s and 80s um, of, of what the tanker industry was about and, and, and indeed as a tanker officer in that period of time, um, I tended to tell my friends that I was actually a, a piano player in a bordello <laughs> rather than actually a, a, a tanker officer. Um, so, you know, it, it, it was not something to be, uh, to be particularly proud of. Um, the last picture is, is quite interesting because it's, uh, you'll see there's a BP ship alongside another ship. The, the ship that's uh, somewhat down on its marks is the Christos Betis, which was a tanker which set off from Rotterdam to Belfast and hit Wales on the way um, and caused quite a serious pollution incident. Um, I only mention it because one of the only good things I can say out of that period of time from my point of view was because I was involved in the salvage of that ship, I got the grand sum of £96 salvage which uh, contributed to my first car. So that's the only positive I can say um, uh, uh, that, that comes from those pictures. Um, how, did the, how did the industry get to the, the situation that it was in in the 1970s uh, and 80s. Uh, the oil shock in 1973 was quite a significant event. Uh, up until the oil shock, we'd been seeing um, massive growth, and massive growth led to uh, massive overbuilding for ship owners. Ship owners have a philosophy in life, and that is if they've got money, they've got to buy ships. Um, and generally, the market collapses not long after that, and, and you, you run through many years of recession. And I'll, I'll talk about that again in, in a few minutes. So we had, um, we had the oil shock, we had the, the, the global recession that ran for several years, um, we had overbuilding, and that, that led to, to low rates. And those low rates lasted for about 10 to 20 years. Um, they caused a major <laughs> shift um, in the industry. Uh, obviously, cost became an issue, cost cutting, uh, became more and more. We, we saw cutbacks on uh, maintenance on ships and, and, and the likes of that. You saw a change in the structure of the industry. From an industry that was dominated in the 60s and 70s um, by the oil majors and their, their large own fleets with them carrying the bulk of their cargoes by themselves, you move to an outsource model. Um, the shipping industry moved to an outsource model, um, I believe, long before the, the exploration um, business moved to that, to that model. Um, I have um, clear recollections in the, in the 1980s of being told by mining agents, you don't need to worry about staff anymore, we're going to deal with that, um, and um, you, can, you can just rest easy at night. It was only four or five years later that those same people were saying to us, um, you've got to take responsibility for training and cadets. So that didn't last very long from, from the industry point of view. Um, a lot of ships moved from high quality fleets to low quality fleets. Um, and as time went by with the combination of cost cutting and the fact that you'd had a massive building boom in the 1970s, you ended up with 
uh, block obsolescence. We had ships that were 20 years old, hadn't been maintained, and in that, 70s, that, in that 80s to 90s period, you started seeing the, um, the, the problems coming along. Now, the question obviously is, um, why did nobody pick up, pick up on that? And, and the answer um, was there was a very limited compliance regime uh, in, in the tanker industry in those days. Um, the, uh, there, was a, there was a race to find the cheapest flag of convenience to operate. Flag of conveniences didn't necessarily set up the infrastructure that they needed to, to ensure compliance with the, the legislation. Um, <coughs> classification societies, of which there were many in those days, there were about 50 to 60 classification societies, of which I think only about 11 or 12 were in what was called IACS, the International Association of Classification Societies, and again had very close working relationships with um, ship owners. <coughs> the charterers, the customers in all of this, um, uh, had, had come to the view that you had to meet um, uh, international standards, and if you had to meet international standards, then it, it wasn't necessary for the charterer to do anything um, extra to to, um, uh, to 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 ensure compliance. Excuse me a minute. Okay, there's a quiz here, and I'm sorry, there isn't a prize. I'm not going to offer you a Kindle or anything like that. Um, can anybody who is not closely involved in the uh, in the uh, emergency management business um, give me a view as to what the biggest oil oil spill in tankers has been over the last forty or fifty years? Any, any others? I'm a cook it is. There we go. Okay, I won't um, I won't uh, drag it out any longer. Um, Exxon Valdez Des was the 35th largest spill. <laughs> um, the Eric is not even on the chart, which uh, suggests it's somewhere between 20 and 35. Um, if you look at these, um, if you look at these. Uh, this slide, you'll probably get down as far as Yamoko Cadiz before you see anything you recognize. If you go a bit further, you'll find the Torrey Canyon, and then you'll head down towards the likes of the Brer, the Sea Empress, and the Prestige, and then you get to the Exxon Valdez. The big ones out there, the Atlantic Empress, the EBT Summer, the Castillo de Bavar, um, I don't think anybody in this room will, will remember. Um, and there is, there is a reason for that. Uh, it may be difficult to see, um, but you can very clearly see that if you're going to have an oil spill, the first thing you should do is choose where you're going to do it. <laughs> um, so you can see that the Atlantic Empress, which was the biggest one, happened in the Caribbean and, and didn't get an awful lot of airplay at the time. The Castillo de Belver um, was off South Africa. And in fact, about 10 or 15 years ago, there was a, there was a sudden flurry of noise in the press, um, which was about the fact that, the Castillo, that, that there was oil coming up in beaches in, in southern Africa. And the belief was it had come from the Castillo de Belvoir. Um, it turned out it wasn't. It turned out that it, it had come from a, a Chinese bulk carrier which had sunk with all hands. And it just disappeared off the press. Um, completely forgetting that something like 30 people had died in that incident. The, the, the oil bit was the, was the bit that seemed to, be, seemed to be important. So you can see concentration up there. Some of the big ones have been around, around Europe. Um, and clearly there's the Exxon Valdez up there. So, as I said, it's an interesting point. It picks up, um, it picks up the where you have your spill is actually a very important thing. Um, I want to talk a bit about the, about the good news from the point of view of the, uh, of the oil industry, uh, of the tanker industry. Every year, um, a, an organization called Intertanker, which is the international, um, the Independent Tanker Owners Association, produces these statistics, and they've been doing this for about, for about 30 or 40 years. And it's quite good because it does give you a picture of, of what's happened. I particularly like this, this graph because it, it, has, um, it has two, um, two y-axis. Um, one is the number of, number of incidents, so you get a, an idea of frequency. So frequency of incidents gives you some idea as to how your, your uh, preventative barriers are working to some extent. And then the right-hand axis, which is the, 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 black, um, uh, the black bars, uh, is the amount of pollution, in other words, the, the, the severity. So that, that gives you an idea of how the protective barriers rather than the preventative barriers have worked. And o overlaying this, I've tried to, to put a lot of information, and I'll, 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 you know, you'll get the slides at the end, and, and you can have time to, um, to, to look at the, the, uh, sort of 
the, the bits and pieces there. Um, along the bottom, you can see long period of low earnings. We had a big boom in the in the in the two thousands. Big big rate boom, big construction boom, and things looked really rosy until about two thousand and nine, and then suddenly we were in this world again of low freight wa freight rates and overcapacity, <coughs> which is pretty predictable. You always get that when you overbuild. Um, during that time, you had a lot of um, legislation that was tightened. Tightened SOLAS, Safety of Life at Sea, was the original legislation that was brought in after the, the Titanic and has been developing ever since. It's administered by an organization called the International Maritime Organization, which is a UN organization. And that organization um, has um, the, the right to produce all legislation to do with deep sea operations. <laughs> and the signatories to, to the convention have to, um, have to participate in what um, uh, IMO require them to do. So SOLAS was safety of life at sea, MARPOL was marine pollution, and STCW was standards for training and certification of watchkeepers. So those were the, the things that were developed from a legislative point of view. During that period of time, compliance was not particularly heavy. As I said, the, the um, flag states were not um, being particularly uh, robust in their, in their compliance regimes. And one of the results of that was that you had lots of legislation that was being applied by the quality owners that the, the, the less quality owners weren't paying any attention to at all. Predictably, the quality owners then started going to the wall because they couldn't keep up the, um, the, the, the operation. Um, we then got into a period after the Exxon Valdez. Exxon Valdez size, size was not the issue in, in, in the, the Exxon Valdez. It was a level of outrage. Um, and from about 1990 onwards, my, a good part of my career in BP shipping was focused on, we've had the Exxon Valdez, we don't want to have a similar tanker incident in, in BP. Um, we set up a vetting organization, as did all the oil majors. Um, the various ports who had, who had seen, um, or the various um, countries that had seen the oil washing across their shores said, well, actually, um, Flag states, we don't care whether you apply your rules or not. We're going to make sure you do. So you ships coming into port suddenly became overrun with port state surveyors. <coughs> they became overrun with oil company surveyors who were there to make sure the rules were being followed. Um, and, um, you know, things did improve reasonably, reasonably dramatically. Um, you saw the, the, the other bit of the, ex, the Exxon Valdez. Uh, double hull became mandatory in 1995. There wasn't a lot of building, but well, once you get into the 2000s, a lot of new ships came in in that 2003 to 2009 period. So lots of new ships coming in, double hull, and to some extent you can see that showing in the, in the, in the small number of, of, of pollution incidents that are there. The ISM code, the International Safety Management Code, was the, was the production of a safety management system for ships, a mandatory safety management system for ships. Um, and then Erica and Prestige brought in some new uh, legislation and um, along the bottom, you can see a thing called TMSA. This is the Tanker Management Self-Assessment System, um, which was the oil majors saying, well, here is how we think, of it. Here is how we think um, an, oil, uh, an oil tanker company should be run, and here is a, a, a book that you can read that will allow you to test yourself against it. Um, and, and that, again, heavily, heavily focused on process. You will notice, I put human factors up there, question mark. You will notice the bulk of this is to do with you know, plant process people sort of model. The bulk of this is to do with plant and process. A lot of it's to do with hardware, a lot of it's to do with procedures. There's a bit of, there was a bit of stuff to do with, um, with competency, but, but not too heavy on that in the, in the early days. So if you, look at this, if you look at this picture, you'll see the good news is, um, is the way that it's come down between um, 1979 and, and 2003. You'll see that the even better news is the way that the black bars have come down, the, the oil pollutions have come down um, to where we are in 2007-2008 where the oil spills from tankers were minimal and I you know, touch wood. Um, and I touch wood because there's that, up, there's that upward blip there. Again, that upward blip says there's something happening on the frequency side of things, which I'll, I'll come back to in a minute. There's something happening on the frequency side of things. While the severity stuff has been dealt with to a great extent by double hulls, um, double hulls will, will only deal with a low impact um, collision or grounding. At some point, if we keep seeing those curves go back up again, you could see another incident. And then 
all that we've achieved over the last many years will be will be will disappear in, in the middle of a lot of a lot of flack. Um, let me talk a bit. Excuse me. Let me talk about what drove the improvement, and I'm and I'm talking to to great extent about about the the bit behind it, the, the sort of management bit behind it. The first thing was there was a single goal. Everybody was absolutely focused on that one goal, which was oil pollution. There was a strong motivation, and the motivation was, if you don't, if you don't run your ships the way that the, the customer wants, you aren't going to get any cargoes. It's really quite simple. Um, a number of ship owners did, did make the point to me on occasion that, that there wasn't a premium for, um, for quality in the tanker industry, to which my answer was, yes, it's 100% premium. You get nothing if you don't have quality. Um, and I don't think arithmetically that's correct because infinity's in there, but never mind. Um, there were global standards. IMO drove the standards at, at the highest level. There were global standards created within the industry. An organization called the Oil Companies International Maritime Forum was, was involved in creating, creating standards. There's a thing called the International Safety Guide for Oil Tankers and Terminals that everybody is expected to, to follow. Um, and and that, was, that was really important. There was a consensus as well. Charters, legislators, owners were working together in, in, in all of this. Um, and behind it all, you had, as I mentioned earlier, strong compliance. You had the vetting, the vetting um, uh, sort of inspectors in the port state inspectors providing that compliance. And as a, a, a sort of American Secretary of State, I think, once said, um, the slightly politer version of it is once you've got them by the throats, their hearts and minds soon follow. Um, and, and that was particularly effective in, in getting things to, to, uh, to move forward. Oops, excuse me. Um, but let's not, lose sight of, let's not lose sight of the fact that there was a blip at the end. And to me, there are, there are two sort of sets of factors, macro and micro. The ones in red, just not going to talk too much about them. I'm going to come back to them. But, but to me, um, the, 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 the industry has changed quite significantly over the last 10 years. First of all, the focus has changed. There are now multiple goals. It's not just oil, uh, oil pollution. There's greenhouse gases, there's air quality, there's ballast water, there's, there's piracy, there's, there's security following 9-11. There's a whole bunch of other things out there that people are, are having to deal with. And indeed, some of them conflict. So if you look at air quality, for example, air quality to some extent conflicts with greenhouse gas because to deal with air quality, you need to burn, burn more fuels um, to, to some extent to, to run scrubbers and the likes of that, and that uh, in fact, uh, affects greenhouse gla gas. And you know, it, it, it's becoming very confusing for the man aboard ship to work out what's important. The motivation has changed. Freight rates have plummeted, cost pressures are back again, and finance costs are an issue. No more on that until I, I come back to it later. There are more regional rules. Dare I say it, the US Coast Guard, the EU, are producing are producing regional rules you will see more regional rules being produced in the far east and again that's making it more difficult for people to pick out what's important and the consensus is weakening we are seeing more the, the industry organizations that used to to work together i thought you were going to walk out there <laughs> <laughs> um, the consensus is weakening there are more battles within the industry than there were before from a micro point of view one of the arguments is more ships, more accidents. It doesn't work when you actually break it out per 100 ships, then, um, then the, uh, the per 100 ships um, uh, rate still shows a downward trend. The, the TMSA has probably improved reporting. So you could make an argument, I'm not very happy with it, you could make an argument that better reporting has pushed up the, the statistics, and I've heard that one so many times, I'm a bit cynical. You had a massive influx of new ships, and teething problems. You had the old bath cup, bathtub curve when, a, when a, a, a piece of equipment is new, you have a lot of breakdowns and failures. When a piece of equipment is old, you have a lot of breakdowns and failures. And then the bit in the middle, you're not hitting that, that many. So it's absolutely clear with new ships, new shipyards, and a whole bunch of new technology out there that, that there were probably more, um, uh, more uh, incidents as a result of that. Uh, the new technology was a problem. Things like groundings went up during that period because people were having difficulty coping with, with the likes of electronic charts. And then we had a big experience gap from that period in the 80s and 90s when the, the, the oil majors in particular outsourced their manning. Um, the people that would have been recruited then would be the senior officers now. So there's a, an interruption there. And then there is a thing called comple complexity. Um, unfortunately, <coughs> to talk about complexity, you have to be complex. So I'm going to 
run through this reasonably quickly, but I, I just want to try and get a, a few points um, across out of it. Over a period of time, the industry has, has become, uh, has relied more and more on regulations, procedures, um, and, and, and communications. And as time has gone by, that has not only increased, but the rate of increase of that has, has increased. And to some extent, I think one of the issues in all of this is, um, is the law of diminishing returns. In the early days of, um, of continuous improvement, there were a lot of easy wins. As you go further down the curve, you have to put more resources into smaller wins. And, and to, to my mind, a, a lot of the problems that we, we have at the moment with complexity is an absolute desire when something goes wrong to do something about it. Even though the, the expenditure um, to risk reduction ratio doesn't, doesn't work particularly effectively. Over that period as well, um, compliance has increased quite dramatically. And it's not symmetrical, but it makes a nice picture that it looks symmetrical. But, but they, have, they have both increased at, at ever increasing rates. Um, so people aboard ship have had to cope with a whole load of extra rules and a whole load of people checking up on those rules. And their own capacity to absorb those rules has dropped quite dramatically. Not, because there's less pe not just because there's less people aboard the ship, but because of experience, training, because of um, the way that the, the, the rules are being presented um, and, and a variety of things like that. There is an infinite amount of technology available at the moment to produce new procedures. There's not very much that helps people to absorb those procedures. So th there's something about making sure that, that what you produce is, is capable of being, um, of being uh, carried out. In that space at the top, oops, sorry, in that space at the bottom, um, where you, your ability to absorb has, uh, has exceeded uh, what's been produced, you get a box ticking culture. You can be pretty damn sure that every audit that's carried out or every checklist that's carried out, the boxes are ticked. But you can't be absolutely sure that, that what was required behind it has actually been carried out. Um, it's just a mechanism that people, people create to get through their day. Um, I, I remember reading a report on a, on a ship where there was a, an incident to do with chemicals and reading a, a, a risk assessment on it, it said, you know, they, they, they looked through the, um, the uh, um, MSDS for it. There wasn't an MSDS for it. There wasn't an MSDS on board the ship. The labels on the thing were not in a language that was understood by anybody aboard the ship, but it was still ticked off. That, you know, that box ticking culture. At the, other, at the other side of things, you've got to cut corners. The people aboard ship have got to work out what is important. They don't have any, they don't have any great help in it because there's so much coming down um, on them. Um, I've kind of tried to build this, build this sort of picture of, um, of how this has developed. You know, so, so to start off, there was anarchy. There was loads of people aboard a ship and there was no rules and nobody was checking up on them. I don't remember that in my lifetime. It probably goes back to the, um, the you know, Odyssey of Ulysses or, or, or something like that. But um, you know, that, that was an early stage. Simplicity, there was, there was less people aboard the ship. There were some rules that you had to follow um, and there was some checking up. Um, there wasn't a lot of communication coming from the office because there was this wonderful barrier to communication called telex. Um, telex was a really useful, uh, useful thing for keeping the office off your back. Um, so you, you, know, you, didn't get, um, you didn't get quick answers um, from the office. A, a, a lovely story. Um, a, a chief engineer in BP Shipping, very famous for being taciturn to, to say the least of it, um, sent a telex to the office and um, said, um, ship stopped. Um, and the office, after going through the usual rigmarole, I mean, the sort of 24-hour turnaround time from the telex getting to the office, it being replied and sent back to the ship and getting through the traffic lists and all the rest of this sort of stuff, the question came back from the, uh, the office, why ship stopped? Reply came back, engine stopped. 24 hours later, why engine stopped? Back came some, comes a message, boiler, boiler broken. Why boiler broken? Ship going again. <laughs> There's a lot to be learned from that. Then there was a period of clarity where, where I think there was some sort of balance. There was, there was enough information that was getting out there to the ships. There was enough compliance to be making sure, sure that, um, that things were being done properly. Um, and then you move into a period which I call confusion. There, is, there are so many goals, there are so many rules, there's so much compliance. People don't really know what they're, that they're having to follow. And, and from a management point of view, I always recall the discussions that we had, which, which generally included the, why the blazes don't they do what they're told? Well, the answer is, they didn't know which bit of what they were told to do they were doing. 
So you then moved on to another stage, which I call distortion, which is where I think we get into the uh, into the, the HR sort of, sort of point of view, which is on the one side of it, you've got the threat of sacking people if they don't actually do what they're supposed to do, irrespective of whether they can actually make sense of what, what's, um, what's being said. And on the other side of it, um, you have giving people bonuses um, for for the, the correct, in inverted commas, performance. And, and to a great degree, that distorts the person's underlying professionalism away from, actually, this is what I think is the right thing to, well, this is what will get me the bonus or avoid me getting sacked. So to me, there's a, there is an issue in there about people's motivation and their understanding of, of goals. Um, in my view, as you, as you hit that clarity stage, the, gra the graph keeps going up it, uh, as well. This is intuitive, it's not investigative, it's not supported by detailed statistics, but, but it is my impression of the way the industry is, has, has developed. Um, let me just talk very quickly about issue number two, which was markets and costs. That's a, that is a picture of the uh, of freight rates going right back to the 1970s. You can see that peak in 1973, where the industry went absolutely through the top. That was when I joined the industry. It collapsed the day afterwards. Um, <laughs> How an 18-year-old cadet could cause that to happen, I have no idea. Um, and then you can see as we've gone along, we've had another massive great big peak in the, in the 2005, 2006 period, and we are back down to, um, to, to low rates now, and the, the, the expectations from industry pundits are you're talking about low rates for another five years, another, another 10 years, because there is such an overhang of tonnage. So we, we're in a situation not unlike the one that we were in in the 1970s and 1980s. I hope, I believe, it's not going to it's not going to change quite so dramatically. This is comes from a guy called James Reason. There's a very very book, very good book called Managing the Risk of Organisational Accidents. I've kind of adapted it. What it really says is, it, is a company is um, is caught between bankruptcy and catastrophe, and, in, and somewhere in the middle is is a is a region of safe operation. In the low freight rate world that that the shipping industry industry is in at the moment the bankruptcy line has moved further towards the middle. Now, it isn't as simple as it, as it was before um, because you have the global village sort of effect. People are out there um, talking about what's going on. So if a, if a ship owner is having cash flow issues, then you can be pretty sure it will be picked up and there's a pretty fair chance that, that if it doesn't get resolved quite quickly, then creditors will stop um, giving them uh, you know, giving them supplies and, and all the rest of that sort of stuff. And you know, you'll, you'll get, into a, get into a problem pretty quickly. On the quality side of things, the quality issues get picked up very quickly because the betting organizations and US Coast Guard and Port State have targeting mechanisms. They have sophisticated computer systems and they're watching what's happening. So the moment they see something going wrong with the ship owner, that ship owner will be targeted and will be inspected more and more. And if they're going down the slide as they're being targeted more and more, then, then suddenly they'll find that they can't actually get any cargoes, they can't get any earnings and they go out of business. So there is a quality driver um, to, to uh, sorry, a quality group driver, which if not respected, will result in um, will result in uh, ships going out of business. That's it in the in the classical Greek model: the banks, the shareholders, the creditors on one side, legislators and customers on the other, and shipping companies stuck somewhere in the middle. Um, to succeed, owners will need to be resilient, and you know, to me, resilience. The ability of an organisation to succeed in difficult times, not just to survive, to succeed. To, to achieve that, I need to move on a little bit quickly, um, the organisation needs to have clear, clear goals, it needs to be agile. It needs to be capable of learning, it needs to be capable of anticipating what's next, it needs to be able to adapt and it needs to be able to monitor. More imp most importantly of all, it needs to have people there who can think, not just follow the rules, and that is absolutely crucially important. Um, if, you if you look at operations, there are three sort of main operating modes. One is normal, one is abnormal, one is emergency. Normal is what the designer expected to happen and what the person who trained the people on board expected to happen. That's, that's routine. Everybody aboard the ship understands it. Abnormal is the systems are a bit degraded, but, it, but it's still within the, the reasonable expectation. Emergency is, whoops, there is absolutely no way that this is anything that we expected and none, nothing to do with my training will help me with this, or very little to do with my training will, um, will help me with this. Um, from the point of view of the emergency side of things, the way that you deal with emergencies is different to the way that you deal with the normal ab and abnormal side of things. You can't just follow a set of rules and hope things will, will, um, will work for you. 
the resilient organization will be able to recover from that. What I call the brittle organization, a brittle organization is spending all of its time and energy and effort in just keeping the day-to-day -day going. And if it's keeping the day-to-day -day going, then it doesn't have any spare capacity to deal with emergencies. And that's where you start to see things going, going seriously wrong. Um, I'm, I'm going to skip over this reasonably quickly. Um, the message is at the top, resilience is about people. The downward resilience bit is about the organization explaining very clearly what's expected um, on board the ships to uh, people to understand their goals and all the rest of that. The upward resilience bit at the bottom is, is about having the right people in the right jobs, the right training, as David mentioned earlier. Um, and, and is about what I call the human contribution, not human error. The human contribution is the number of times that the people on board your ships save you from the consequences of your stupidity rather than their, stu their stupidity. Um, and, and in the middle of it, you have operations management, which, is a, which should be like a thin film and shouldn't be impeding communications flow between them and has to deal with all the customer requirements and regulator requirements. I'm sorry I rushed that. Um, you can see that at leisure when you, you actually get your... Um, get your slide packs. I want to talk a bit about lessons from tanker quality. Again, up in the management level, um, it's worked with global tanker trading. What, what has happened in the global tanker business has been quite effective. It's worked because of charter in it, instance, it's worked because of vetting. Um, regional, coastal and inland fleets of tankers have not been as, as effective, particularly when you have what's called cabotage, flag state controlling the um, control, controlling the local trade. You don't have the power, is, is the, way that the, the way you can look at the balance of power between the, the, the vetting organization and the local authorities isn't strong enough for you to be able to change things. In the offshore, in offshore marine operations, and I have some experience of trying to set this, the, this kind of thing up in, um, in, in sort of relatively remote regions. First of all, you have, it is regional. The regional supply, the, the fleet, the supply boat fleets, for example, are in general are, are regional. They're operating within within that region, um, so there isn't that global push that that um, that would be there otherwise. There are political issues. Um, in one in one particular case, I, I recall the people who ran the biggest fleet also were the people who had the authority to implement the IMO legislation, and that's a kind of moral hazard situation that you just don't want to have. Um, and then you have local aspirations. Quite correctly. Um, if you've got a lot of oil, you want your own community to be involved in that. And that takes time for you to, to build those local skills. Running, running on very quickly, um, I just want to run through some sort of conclusions. Um, so the tanker industry has improved. There's absolutely no question about, it, about that, and we should, be, we should be happy about it. Much of that improvement has been planned and process-based, uh, and that, that's, that is also um, worth remembering. However, the context has changed in the shipping industry. We've got complexity there that there wasn't there before. We've got a low market that was there before. So we can't be smug about, about anything that's happened in the tanker industry. It could just as easily go the other way now. There are choices that people have got to make and, and the, the management choices that people have got to make about cost and risk um, are, are in, in my view, quite important. Um, and, and I believe that the, the, the concept of resilience is something that people need to, to look at more and more. I believe that the mechanisms that we've got available are transferable to under sec uh, other sectors, so you can sort of standardise on inspection reports. Controversial point. Um, you can uh, uh, standardise on inspection reports, and you can build that sort of global strength about it. Um, but you know, let's not be daft about this. You can't just transfer a model from one industry to another industry um, and hope everything will go uh, will go absolutely peachy. That is as much as I have to say. I'm sorry I rushed the last little bit there, but I wanted to make sure I left some time for you to to ask me some questions if you so wish. Thank you, Martin. Just, just to emphasize a point that Martin actually made, um, in a few days' time, all the, unless any of the speakers say, well, you, n you can't put my slides up there, all the slides will be available on our website, plus video of, the, uh, of, of what's just happened. Um, so you'll be able to follow that. So no particular need to scribble lots of notes. You'll be able to put things up, let's say, Monday, Monday morning or next week. Okay, any, any questions from anybody? Please. Yeah, I, uh, Mr. Westgate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, we've known each other for quite a while, but do you think, I mean, going through that, a, a lot of the way the business can progress is by learning. 
and by learning from its own mistakes. And do you not think that actually we're going back a way? Because we, we made a big thing between the, the 80s and the 90s where we didn't recruit, we didn't have the experience, you know, cadet ships went down. So now we're looking at a, a state where a lot of uh, superintendents are extremely are coming towards retirement. There's not much youth, youth coming through, there's not much experience because it wasn't done. But what we did was to the industry, what it did was, was sort of a sudden, well, let's bring the certification back. Training is less. And now what we're finding now is within the industry, your, your basic seafarer is missing the basic skills that was done with the original training, your seafarer training, your seafarer skills. So with, by getting people on the ships to, 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 to get the certification, we've lost that basic, that basic seamanship skills and training that we need and experience. And in another 10 years, we're going to find the same problem as we had 10 years ago. Yeah, I, 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 I agree. I think um, fundamentally training is learning from your mistakes. Actually, it's not. It's learning from your mistakes and from your successes. So, so fundamentally training is sharing that, is sharing that knowledge. And, and, I, and I think this is, it's another one of these, one of these input and output issues. Um, it is very easy for you to create web systems that will allow you to access that, you know, all that knowledge and learning. The problem is having the capacity to actually go in and grab that information and, 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 and deal with it. And, and just reading a website or something like that isn't going to do it. You need simulation, as David was, David was talking about. Um, I, I believe that the law of diminishing returns is hitting, is hitting the learning from your mistakes bit. Because, you know, as I said, when, you, when, when the shipping industry really started pushing the continuous improvement cycle in the, in the 90s, um, you, were, you, you, you got some really big wins for not very much effort. As time has gone by, as you've learned from mistakes, um, people have uh, and got down to the lower bit of the curve. As you've learned from mistakes, you've you've felt obliged to put more legit, more regulation in or more more rules in, um, and forgotten about the cost, and that that squeezes out other things that people should be doing. I, I think there's a critical point here, and that is, we overly focus on learning from our mistakes. We don't learn from success. How can we actually get people to share the good things that have happened, the human contribution stuff that I was talking about earlier? How do you get people to share the good things, how you do things well, rather than, than always focusing on, on disaster and, and mayhem and, and, and the likes of that? So you know, there's, a, there's a balance there, but I, I, I agree with you. The, 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 the lack of depth of experience and training is, is an issue. Um, quick question following up on uh, the, the point you made about the um, unreported accident with the Chinese bulk carrier off South Africa. Mm. There's a lot of aspirations here. How much impact is the growth of China um, and its potential monopoly of bulk carrier going to make a lot of this aspirational? Um, so, so actually, um, so far, so, so as far as the oil industry, the, the oil tanker industry has been concerned in the 2000s, the bulk of the growth in the tanker industry has been driven um, by the Chinese market. Um, you know, the year-on-year -year growth that's, that's driven the boom and driven the, the overbuilding has, has been driven by the Chinese market. We are not, we're not seeing at this stage um, uh, anything from the, the, the Chinese receivers that suggests that they're not interested in the, the quality issues as well. And what you've also got to remember is that they're only one end of the equation, a very important end of the equation, at the other end of the, 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 the equation, if taking, uh, taking oil to China, is a loading port. And that loading port may well be a, um, an oil major run port, or, or indeed any of the OCIMP members, of which there are 50 to 60, including Saudi Aramco and all those sort of people, who are all wanting to protect their strategic assets because they've seen what happens uh, if you don't protect them. So, so I'm, not, I'm not seeing an indication at the moment um, that the dominance of China is beginning to reduce, you know, reduce quality in any way. They're, they're showing as much interest as anyone else is in keeping standards up. I would say. There was another one here. Did yeah. Oh, Thanks. Neil Dulling from MOL Tankship in London here. Um, <coughs> do you think that uh, the spike we saw in accidents um, in the early two thousands? might be to do with the level of uh, over-regulation and the law of diminishing returns applying to that level of regulation. There's been a lot of push of 
charterers, vetting people, all pushing, all coming on, all wanting to do their checks. That is a, a, a very large time cost for the ships. And while they're doing all of those checks, they can't be doing the other things that they've been doing in the past. And what are, are, do you believe we're seeing uh, the possibility that this level of regulation is actually affecting the performance of the industry? So yes, I think it, it's the simple answer is yes. I think that, that, was, that was the point I was trying to bring out in, the, in that um, complexity slide. The, the, the level of complexity that, is, um, that has been created over the last 10 to 20 years, as you said, start off with law of diminishing returns. You're at, you're at the you know, big reduction, small cost stage to start with. Now I believe we're in the small, the small reductions, large cost stage. There are only so many people aboard the ship. There's only so many things you can do. And, and one of their one of their biggest sort of challenges is, is just getting through the day. That, that we do quite sort of facetiously suggest that it would be an interesting test of a shipping company's um, management system for them to bring a complete officer set of, of people uh, into the office and get them to go through their entire day's work following the company's regulations and then work out how many days it takes to do it. I'm uh, very interested in a couple of comments really around where we overbind people with regulations and almost remove the element of being able to use common sense. Um, I've heard this in other quarters where people are, are so bound that the journey becomes better than the result. How do you change a company's culture where it doesn't try and regulate people to death and so they can't actually use their, their nous, as we would say? <coughs> So I think if you look, if you go back to the sort of complexity picture, it's about taking it back down the curve again and getting back to, to, to a world where um, people are clear what their goals are, what they're, what, they're, what they're there to do, and are motivated to, to, to meet those goals, and have a, um, a, a less intense set of rules that they've got, they've got to, to follow. Um, and, and also, I believe, you, you've actually got to up the training of people aboard ships because there is a tendency to react. There's a, react for a reaction from the ship owner who, who, when something happens, feels an obligation to do something about it. It's a very brave ship owner who says, well, I'm not going to do something about it. Um, and indeed, legislators become involved in, 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 um, in, in doing something about it. Um, so, so to me, you've got to improve the the ability of people to to react. Simulation, I think, is a very good way of, of doing that. Impro improve the ability of, of people to, to react, to stop the incidents, to stop them developing <coughs> any further than they should do. Um, and, and in the course of doing that, push back some of the, the legislation. Uh, and uh, Sorry, start again. It's not legislation, it's rules. The, you know, the, the shipping industry are not, are not just victims in all of this. They create a lot of the rules themselves. So they, what the ship owner does, how the ship owner takes that complexity and just feeds it to the ship it is a critical thing. If you take that complexity and try and bring some simplicity to it and, and support the people aboard ship, then you'll get them, you, you'll get them to, uh, to react more effectively. But, but what I think you need, and this is almost, uh, this ceiling may open up and a lightning bolt may well sort of strike me down for saying this, um, but but, uh, but uh, there's a thing I would describe as constructive indiscipline, and that is when somebody knows enough enough about what they're doing to turn around and say, you would need to be barking mad to do this. We're not <laughs> going to do it this way. Now, there's a destructive indiscipline as well in the middle of all of that, but you know we really need to take more account of the people aboard the ship who are actually doing the, the job and listen to them more carefully when they say, you've got to be barking mad. Why would you do it this way? So I don't know if that answered your question. It, it does, and I think the comment you make about being able to push back, mm. um, we seem to have got into a stage where we say rule bind people that if you try and push back, you get, it, you get yourself <coughs> on the sort of uh, bad boy list and later on pay for it. And I think that's where you get into this, what, what I described as distortion. So you get into the world where, where it's got so complicated people can't work their way through it. So what, they, what the rules they're following, to some extent, tend to be random. What they can actually fill in during their day I I is limited. So, so, so you then get to this distortion phase which, phase, which is, what do I need to do to get the bonus, and what do I need to do to avoid being sacked? 
you, 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 could, you could throw away 20 or 30 years of, of training and, and, and knowledge by, by getting people to focus on, well, actually, we just want you to do that and you'll get a bonus for it. And remember, the easiest thing to get a bonus for is something that can be measured. The thing that can be measured the most easily is financial performance. It's very difficult to work out how one person is better than another at avoiding accidents. So people will get bonuses for producing financial results. It's very difficult to give them bonuses for producing non-financial results. Um, and people will generally get sacked um, when something goes wrong. <laughs> so there's a, you know, there's a whole thing about goals, motivation, the amount of, the amount of paperwork people have got to deal with, I think, that, that's worth thinking about. I'm sorry, I've run No, 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 it's good, good, good. And we, we have plenty of time anyway. Any, anybody? Yeah. 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 From Greenwich University, I'm doing international maritime policy. Uh, my question is on the regulation compliance regarding the single O and double O button for this tanker. The regulation for tanker is getting tough and tough, especially the, the scrubbing all of the single and double O button. And the most concern is based on EU and the US. I'm just trying to find out what will happen to the tall world country regarding the, uh, the scrubbing all of the double O on the single O, because I, especially for the dodging shipping oil on, because I know if they can say within the EU or the US, they can try as far as to maneuver to, to third world country to like starting sailing. So I just want to know what will happen to the, maybe is, is the concern for the poor state to take the authority. So, um, so the, the phase out the phase out regulations um, come from IMO, so they, they should be universal. They should be, um, but there is there's a long history in the in the tanker industry of um, of people going looking for new markets when the um, when the market that they're in is you know it used to be that if you had a a, a clean product tanker for example which had coated tanks you know good valves and all the rest of that sort of stuff designed for carrying jet fuel and all the rest of that. When the coating rate go down got too bad, then you started carrying fuel oil in it. So there's, you know, there's, a, there's a sort of hierarchy as it, as it, as it goes down. So um, there is absolutely a risk, because I think that there is, if a, company hasn't, a country hasn't actually signed up for MARPOL, yeah. they can still use the ships on their coastal trade. Um, but there's not a, it, it's one of those situations where when you're, when you're looking at it from an oil major point of view, the oil major can't do anything about it. If the, if the, if the country has said, this is what we're going to do, you can't actually change it. So, so it's not a, you know, it's, it's, that's an issue for, that is an issue for the legislators. It's not one that the, that the industry can deal with easily, other than, um, other than the industry saying, well, for the cargoes I'm carrying on that coast, I'm going to use a double huller. And I've been involved in situations where, where we've been running double hullers on a, on a coastal route alongside single hullers. Um, it gets kind of expensive. Uh, the commercial people don't like you, but it seems like the commercial people wasn't always my main aim in life. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> right. Martin, uh, I think it is probably time. Okay. Thank you very much.